GoFundMe brings people together to find the support they need when they need it. First, set a goal amount. Name your fundraiser. Pick a photo or video. And describe why you're fundraising and how donations will make a difference. Don't worry, everything can be edited later. After publishing your fundraiser, it's time to spread the word to as many people as possible. We'll guide you through sharing via social media, emails, texts, and with your local community. You can even fundraise as a group. Add friends, family, or coworkers to help you manage the fundraiser and share to a wider audience. Well, my guest today is Rob Solomon, CEO of GoFundMe. Thank you very much indeed for coming on to France 24 to speak to of us course. today. Thanks for having me. Can you start by telling me just how the idea for GoFundMe first came about? What was the need you were responding to? So there's a big need out there. Many people fall through the cracks. They think that the government is there to help them, that NGOs are there to help them, and, and that should be the way, but oftentimes people have nowhere else to turn, and we find that communities of people come together to help people out. So that was the genesis of GoFundMe, and Ten years later, almost, it's become a global phenomenon. Now, inevitably, with a site like yours, uh, people's most shocking stories, young children in need of urgent medical care, for example, do trigger a more visceral response in donors than, uh, than some other <coughs> campaigns. Um, that does mean that some campaigns are going to be significantly more successful than others, especially if they go viral. How does that sit with you, ethically speaking, when two cases, two ill children, for example, might uh, both be facing a very difficult situation, one of them gets the cash, the other one doesn't? How do you feel about that? Now, Werner visited a community where one hospital has filed hundreds of lawsuits. Anna, they really want their money, it seems like. Yeah. yeah, you know, you work hard, you pay your bills, you try to get ahead. But what if an unexpected medical bill threatens your livelihood, maybe even your health? That's what one couple say they've been going through. Welcome back to CBS This Morning. In our morning rounds, how a routine doctor's visit for a, a sore throat brought more than $28,000 barely in move. An MRI soon showed a bulge in his spine, a herniated disc. And when he went to see a specialist... He said, you need to go to the closest hospital immediately. Immediately. I wanted my son to have a better life than I had. So what do you do as a parent? You sacrifice. Casey says she'd been healthy, but in May of 2016, she had an attack of severe abdominal Road. pain. Um, when I say I felt like I was dying, I felt like I was dying. Alexa Kasten wanted to be sure that her cold symptoms weren't anything serious. So she made an appointment with a doctor that she had seen before, Dr. Roya Fatalahi. She said, OK, I'll give you a strep throat culture. She sent in a nurse and they did blood work. That was it. $650,000, money his insurance company said he would have to pay. They claimed his back surgery was not an emergency and not medically necessary. The total still came to about $31,000. Then to get these bills, crazy. that was so it's overwhelming. A house, a house in Alabama, you say this, this can't be real. Right? I mean, I really don't have to but pay this. How, how am I going to pay this? And you sit there and you start crying because you don't know what you're going to do. For nearly He's years. not the only one. Four in ten consumers pulled in 28. The bill for those throat swab tests totaled more than $28,000. Then in September of 2019, the hospital sued them for the entire balance plus interest. The total, nearly $37,000. At that point, Casey says... I told my husband, I wish you to let me die. How can you even think that? I've told my husband this. I've said, honey, I love you and I love my family, but if you have let me go today, you would not be going through this. But what she says she didn't know was that original $31,000 bill was likely much higher than what she would have paid if she'd had insurance, and some $25,000 more than what Medicare would be charged by a hospital on average for an appendectomy, just $5,800. Clear health costs surveyed cash prices, prices used here as a benchmark for comparison in two major metro areas, Dallas and San Francisco. For a simple blood test, prices range 
changed from $10 to $176 in the Dallas area. In the San Francisco Bay Area, many states, only 12 states, have those laws. So in many states, they could have come after her. And remember, even if she didn't have to pay it, her insurer did, which means everyone in her company is paying those crazy bills. So don't just say, eh, it's not me, I don't care. I think people have a, an assumption for right or wrong that insurance is going to protect them. If we pay that much, we think we're going to be covered, and we're not going to see that surprise bill. So when you do, people are shocked. If I'm hearing you correctly, you're basically saying that people should not expect their insurance to protect them. Isn't that why we have it? So there's protect and there's protect. Plans will have different deductibles, different amount of co-insurance, different amount of co-payments. And it also depends, of course, what they're charging, what the price is and then how much you are responsible for that price. Frank Esposito finally chose to hire and pay extra for a company to negotiate those bills for him. But he still owes over $220,000 and doesn't know how he'll pay. Hi everyone, this is Adrian Majorano. I'm hoping you're taking the time to check out my GoFundMe page that my cousin started for me. Um, I'm dealing with lots of medical bills. Um, yeah, my name is Scott. Uh, my basic story is I'm, I'm having issues with uh, health care providers. And Hello, if you're watching this video, you probably are at least considering supporting our cause, which we appreciate very much. Even Nogwall, even if you can't tell right now. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Zaragoza, a.k.a. Steam Biscuit. I'm a C4-C5 quadriplegic, and I need help obtaining funds to travel to Mayday in Colombia to get stem cell treatment from Bio Accelerator that I pay for. Welcome back, everyone. You know, I usually don't ask for money. I don't think I ever have, but today I'm going to. I'm going to ask that you donate to this. Go fund me for my friend Jarrett Yeoman. Uh yeah, so uh, and I would really appreciate your donations. It would really help me to get through some of the hardships that uh, cancer brings up. As my dad said, uh, you don't plan for cancer. I cannot tell you how obsessed I am with this chart. It shows exactly what is wrong with America's conversation about healthcare. Uh, on one level, you've seen this chart before. It shows healthcare spending as a share of the economy of, of a bunch of countries. There's Germany and France and Japan and Canada and oh, there's America. This is how much of that spending in each country is private and how much is public. Here's what's amazing. America's government spending on healthcare, on programs like Medicaid and Medicare and the VA, our versions of socialized medicine, it's about the same size as these other countries. And then there's our private spending. It's the private insurance system that makes healthcare in America so expensive.
Good morning, Hank. It's Tuesday. I want to talk today about why healthcare costs in the United States are so phenomenally, fascinatingly expensive. You can see in this graph, our private healthcare spending, most Americans are privately insured through their employers, is way higher than anywhere else in the world. In total, the U.S. currently spends about 18% of its gross domestic product on healthcare costs. Australia, by comparison, 9%. Why is this? Well, because everything costs more, which seems obvious, but apparently it isn't, because every article you read is like, oh, it's because of malpractice insurance, or it's because we're obese, or we go to the doctor too much, or people are prescribed too many medications, more than you would expect us to pay, and that turns out to be pretty interesting. Let's start with malpractice and so-called defensive medicine. The idea here is that doctors are scared of huge malpractice suits, so they order a lot of unnecessary tests in order to, like, cover their butts. That does contribute to our healthcare costs, like there are more MRIs and CT scans in the U.S. than anywhere else. Biggest estimates for the total cost of defensive medicine put it around $55 billion, which is a lot of money, but it's only 2% of our total healthcare costs. Another smallish factor, doctors, and to a lesser extent nurses, are paid more in the United States than they are in other countries. And by my possibly faulty math, we end up spending about $75 billion more than you would expect us to there. Then we have the cost of insurance and administrative costs, like paperwork and marketing and negotiating prices, all that stuff. That's about $90 billion more than you would expect us to spend. We spend about $100 billion more than you would expect on drugs drugs, not so much because we take more of them, but because the ones that we take cost more per pill. Okay, and now for the big one. I'm gonna lump inpatient and outpatient care together, because in the U.S. we do a lot of things as outpatient procedures, like gallbladder surgeries, that are often inpatient procedures in other hospitals, so we're just gonna make it a big ball. That big ball is $500 billion more than what you would expect given the size of our economy per year. Why? Well, because in the United States, we do not negotiate as aggressively as other countries do with healthcare providers and drug manufacturers and medical device makers. Other countries, they, they don't have this problem. Instead of every private insurance company negotiating with every healthcare provider, there's just this big list. Country, the central government, they go and they say, if you want to sell to us, to all of our people, then here's what you can charge for a checkup. Here's what you can charge for an MRI or a prescription for Lipitor. Vice President Biden, yes, this is for you. Your health care plan calls for building on Obamacare. So my question is, what is your plan if the law is ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? You have two minutes uninterrupted. What I'm going to do is pass Obamacare with a public option. It will become Biden care. The public option is an option that says that if you, in fact, do not have the wherewithal to be — if you qualify for Medicaid and you do not have the wherewithal in your state to get Medicaid, you automatically are enrolled, providing competition for insurance companies. That's what's going to happen. Secondly, we're going to make sure we reduce the premiums and reduce drug prices by making sure that there's competition that doesn't exist now by allowing the Medicare to negotiate drug prices with the insurance companies. Thirdly, I support private insurance. That's why I didn't — not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. They did not lose their insurance unless they chose they wanted to go to something else. Lastly, we're going to make sure we're in a situation that we actually protect pre-existing. There's no way he can protect pre-existing conditions. That plan on its own, it wouldn't get American health care spending far down overnight, but it would at least begin to recognize what we already know and what most other countries already do, that healthcare is one of those things the government can do cheaper and better than the private sector.